Where are we, Pastor? This evening we're in Exodus chapter 18. Okay? Uh, Rephidim is our location in the Middle East. Uh, but, but before we get to uh, Rephidim, just want to kind of back up and cover a couple things so we can get into the flow of whatever's happening here. You know that God, through Moses, uh, approached Pharaoh, let my people go. Ten plagues later, they did. Pharaoh had uh, second thoughts, chased them to the edge of the Red Sea. God made a way for them through the Red Sea. You remember as they were traveling, they first came to Sukkoth, which is the word for booths. That's the festival that's being celebrated by Jews right now as we speak. It began on the full moon last Sunday and will end this coming Sunday where they remember they're wandering in the wilderness, but that God was with them in that pillar of cloud and fire. And uh, so uh, they come to Sokoth that kind of could translate as to tent town. But the message to the, the uh, Israelites is that you're going to be sojourners, you're pilgrims. Your, your stay is, this is not your permanent home, okay? And God is taking him to the promised land, the land of Canaan. But ultimately, the picture is he's taking us to those golden shores. What a glorious day that'll be, right? Amen. And so, suck up. Until, the, until then, put your tent pegs in, but, you know, you're going to have to move from time to time. You took them there, from there to Etham. And uh, Etham literally translates that God is with them. If you remember, it was the edge of the wilderness. It, you could almost say the brink of disaster. It was, but it was a blank palette. Everything was brand new and open before them, right? And uh, that's where God revealed himself to them in that pillar and started leading them. And then they gave, came to Pi Hahiroth, which is uh, translated the mouth of the gorges. And we saw that was where they went down through this canyon that exited onto the Red Sea. And so basically, it was a one-way street, and there was no way out. You could say they were trapped, that God was setting a trap, but the trap actually wasn't for the Israelites. It was for Pharaoh. And Pharaoh followed them into the trap. He opened up the Red Sea. They crossed, and uh, God put an end to Pharaoh chasing them. That was not going to be an issue anymore for them. From there, they came to Mara, where they, the, the word Mara means bitter, and that was the place where they were three days into the desert. They were thirsting, and the water was undrinkable. God told Moses, see that tree? Cast it in, and the water became drinkable. That bitterness, much like it is in our life, right? Even in our Christian walk, we can find times when we come to a bitter place in life, and there's bitterness in this world. I mean, the death of a loved one, or just the parting of people that you love, or... or all kinds of bad news and calamity, it can be very bitter. But the cure is to throw in the tree, the cross of Jesus Christ. And when you throw the cross of Jesus Christ into your bitter situation, all of a sudden you'll see how sweet it is that Jesus was there for you and he's going to bring you through. From Mara, they went to Elim. Remember, that's the place with the 12 wells and the 70 palm trees. Elim means the mighty ones. And there they had a wonderful rest. God knows when to test, and God knows when to rest. And they, they, they rested at that oasis, and then they went on into the wilderness of sin. And there they were tested by blessing. We think of being tested by temptation and trials. But God, as they whined, said, okay. Instead of punishing them, he says, you'll have meat tonight to eat. And he brought quail. The next morning they had manna, and God provided that manna for them for 40 years. He blessed them and blessed them. But the blessing, it does say back in chapter 16, this blessing is to test you. <coughs> whether you will obey me and worship me, or will you will, whether you will become whiners and complainers. And as we've already seen, uh, they didn't do a really good job in the test, but uh, it's also kind of reflective of us at times. Well, after that, they come to Rephidim. They're thirsty again. God tells <laughs> Moses, take that rod in your hand, take some of the elders, and go to that rock. And I'll be there standing on that rock. And you strike that rock, and water will come out gushing enough to water everybody. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse uh, 4, that that rock which followed them through the water was Christ himself. And so, this is where they are now. They're in Rephidim, 
and they have received water from the rock, manna, bread from heaven. They've got the quail, they've got the meat, they've got the very presence of God, his Shekinah glory, there in the midst of their camp. And they have all these things. And we come to chapter 18, verse 8, verse 1. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer. For he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Okay? This is the mountain of God. Mount Oreb. Okay? That's where Moses first fled uh, to when he was escaping Egypt when he had murdered the Egyptian. And he knew he was a, a refugee. He was a, a wanted man. And so he was, he was a man on the run. He ran and ran and ran to the back of the desert, to the Mount Desolation. That's what Horeb basically translates into is desolation. And sometimes that's where things actually start with your walk with the Lord. And that's where it began, where God in the burning bush met Moses and commissioned him. You've been back here for 40 years, tending sheep, tending Jethro's flocks. And now I think you're finally ready for the work that I've been preparing you for. Go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Here they are. Now back at Mount Oreb, at that rock, that rock which was Christ. We know it as Mount Sinai, where we're going to see in the next two chapters, Moses will go up and meet God on Mount Sinai and receive the constitution of Israel. God will make a covenant with them. He's, he will say, I will be your God, you will be my people, and you will obey my word, and you'll be a testimony to the nations. And then God commands Moses, he goes onto the mountain, he brings down the Decalogue, we know as the Ten Commandments, engraved on two tablets of stone, and, uh, and it goes on with the way, Torah, the law of God, and why Moses is known as the lawgiver. But right now, he hasn't gone up onto the mountain yet, he's camped there, you'll see in next chapter, it's not quite three months since they've left. Nevertheless, it's two months plus. They're in the wilderness. And remember, there were 600,000 men, a little bit more than that, according to Numbers chapter 1, that left Egypt. And we know that, that many of them would be married, many of them would have children, and it also said a mixed multitude accompanied them. So it's not hard to imagine <coughs> Numbers approaching or even exceeding two million people. And here's Moses, their leader. They've already grumbled, complained. Moses goes to God, he prays, he, they, he, God answers, and he's now here at this place. And his father-in-law, Jethro, heard what was happening. I mean, this news is spreading around the world. Egypt, the, the slaves of Egypt, those Israelites that have been building all of their monuments and all their buildings, they, they left. I mean, this is, this is pretty, it's almost like the headlines today with refugees moving from one, one vast place to another. I mean, it's, it's big international news. And Jethro hears about it in Midian. And he comes to investigate. It says, um, verse 2, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, and, and that word father-in-law, could be translated in the Hebrew as brother-in-law. It's basically a male in-law relative. Most people down through the ages have taken it as father-in-law. And part of the reason they do that, if you go back into chapter 2, when we first met him, 
We read in verse uh, 16 of chapter 2, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to, to water their father's flock. Then the shepherds came and drove them away. Okay, So the girls are having a hard time watering their father's flock, the priest of Midian. But Moses stood up and helped them. Yay, Moses. That's chivalry right there, right? And he watered their flock. And verse 18, when they came to Ruel, their father, he said, how is it that you have come so soon today? Usually those pesky boys make it so it takes you much longer, but you're back, you're done early. How did that happen? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us from the hand of the shepherds, and he also drew enough water for us to water the flock. So he said to his daughters, <coughs> where is he? Why is it that you have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. He's done a really wonderful thing for you. How are we going to bless him? This is Middle Eastern hospitality. It's, it's, uh, it's hard to put a, a value on how highly valued hospitality is in the Middle East. It is great, great shame not to be hospitable. They're living in a very desolate, very harsh landscape. A lot of Bedouin type nomadic tribes that move from one place to another, one oasis to another, and when a person meets somebody out there, man, you gotta open up your house. You know, you need something to drink, you need a place to sleep, can I feed you? And hopefully, in that culture, they'll do the same for you when you're in need. So, he says, why didn't you bring him in that we'd have bread? And it says, uh, verse 21, Moses was content to live with the man, this man, Ruel, and gave, he gave Zipporah, his daughter, to Moses, okay? So we know that story. We've already read it. I'm kind of rehashing old news. But uh, this man, his name here is Ruel. Ruel means a friend of God, okay? A friend of Elohim, okay? And so we meet him, and all we know about this is this guy's way out in the desert, in Midian. We see already he's a priest, a priest of Midian, He's a friend of Elohim God. How could this be? We'll find out as we go through the genealogies. Uh, Midian was one of the sons of Abraham and his wife Keturah. After Sarah died, Abraham had another wife. They had children. One of those children was named Midian. And he settled southeast of the promised land uh, on the eastern shores of the Red Sea in what would be current day Arabia, okay? And so he's a priest of Midian, a friend of God, and no doubt probably a friend from all the way back in the days of Abraham and Keturah. And so there's a little interesting little tickle there, if you want, that there are people walking with the Lord that you may not know their pedigree, how they came to know the Lord, who they fellowship with, what kind of a Christian are you? They're Christians, all right. And they may not speak the way you speak or act the way you act, but the fundamental characteristic of a Christian is they have confessed that Jesus Christ is Lord and they believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead. They've called upon Jesus as their Savior for salvation and all who call upon the name of the Lord are saved. And so that kind of, kind of packs into what we do here in this community. God has given us this wonderful home, this fellowship we call the Springs Calvary Chapel, but we are by no means the be-all and end-all of Christianity in Minicasha. There's wonderful Christian churches in our community. We pray for them. We support them. As long as they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're God-fearing, Bible-believing people, God bless them. They may be a little different than us, but they're brothers and sisters in the Lord. This man, a friend of God, Ruel, invites Moses in and gives him his daughter in marriage, Zipporah. We've seen the name Zipporah translated roughly little bird. Some people might say a dove or a sparrow, but she's a little bird, okay? And I'm just going to continue for a minute in chapter 2 here. Uh, and she bore him a son, and he called his name Gershom. For he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And that word Gershom, that means a stranger or an alien. 
somebody who has been expelled, okay? He's on the run, okay? But most would translate it basically a sojourner, okay? No permanent address, okay? And that's what he named his boy, no permanent address, okay? <laughs> You're Gershom. You're just passing through, okay? Uh, and it happened in the process of time, the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Abraham. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 1, and then I'll get back into our text. <laughs> now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro. Now, that's who we were talking about when we first started, back in chapter 18, right? Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Again, could be father-in-law, could be brother-in-law. Most people lean towards father-in-law because we just got introduced to Ruel, right? The friend of God and the father of these seven daughters, Moses' wife, and so we kind of naturally make the leap to father-in-law. Either one can work in this situation, but what is really important to note is however you discern this, if it's two people or one, and I tend to think it's one person. Ruel, the name means friend of God, and Jethro, or Yether, literally means uh, a remnant or the excellence of the remnant. And it would fit his title as a priest of Midian, that he is part of the remnant, part of the children of God, worshipers of Yahweh God, Elohim, and yet not part of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Is that possible that other people could be worshiping God besides descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Certainly could, right? In fact, you're going to see it throughout the Bible. Get ready. It shows up from time to time. There's other Christians out there besides us. There's other saints out there besides us. But I just want to bring that out. Jethro, or Yether, his name means remnant or excellence. And now let's look at what happens. I'm going to back up to verse 2, chapter 18. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. So... This introduces a new piece of information, and it's a bit of a conundrum. It's a bit of an enigma. We really don't know when he sent her back or why he sent her back. He was, he was legally married to her. They had, we're going to see in a second here, children. And yet at some point between the time he left, went to Pharaoh, the plagues, and now comes back here, he had sent Zipporah back to the family in Midian. A possibility of why or when that happened can be seen in chapter 4. If you remember this interesting incident at verse 24 in chapter 4, it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met and sought to kill him, sought to kill Moses. God met him, and he was going to kill Moses. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you are a husband of blood to me, or a bridegroom of blood to me. So he, God, let him, Moses, go. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. Now, is that when he sent her back home? We don't know. We can speculate the whole time that he was in Egypt, meeting with Pharaoh, pleading with Pharaoh, the plagues, they don't seem to have lasted much more than about four months. Nobody knows. You kind of use little bits and clues with, from them, and you can build a, it could have been a year, but four months would get everything done that was done in the ten plagues. So that's not a long time from the time where he was on his way to see Pharaoh, and now he's come back, right? Four months plus two and a half months, 
maybe six months ago, maybe, but somewhere in there, obviously, clearly, it says he, after he sent her back. Now, I'm just putting these pieces together for you. If you ever read this and you scratch your head and you wonder, hmm, you ever do that? You're reading the Bible like that's one of those hmm moments. Well, one of the things I advise you to do, when you come to a place in the Bible and you're confused and you're really not certain what it means, it doesn't hurt to get some of your Bible study helps, your tools. You can go to online at the Blue Letter Bible. They have all kinds of dictionaries, concordances, Bible helps. There's commentaries from various people. And, and quite often, you can go and find pretty good sense of a situation. I will tell you right now, if you go and look this one up, and you look at what all the commentators say, you can ask like three commentators and get five answers. <laughs> this is one of those ones that nobody really knows for a fact. When you come to a place in the Bible where it's not explicit, black and white, super clear, one of the things you can do is just say, put that in the little file cabinet for further revelation. How often you do that and how continuously you read the Bible, you will be blessed as you're in some other study some other day. And all of a sudden, that piece that didn't make any sense to you fits. And this is how God's word works, okay? We've got 66 books authored by 40 or more different authors from three different continents, from multiple millennia, from all walks of life, from princes to paupers and fishermen to farmers, and they all are writing, and yet everything is a whole. And in fact, it's interesting, it's not like it just makes a complete whole picture What's amazing about the Bible is it makes a complete whole hologram. You know the difference between a picture and a hologram? Pictures are 2D. They're flat. Holograms are 3D. And as you turn around a hologram, you can, I, you, I could have a hologram of me right here, and you could walk around the back side and see the back of my head. And you can stand on that side and see my face. Holograms are amazing, 3D. And that's what God's Word is. So sometimes, and I'm, in, I'm inviting you to maybe take this little piece of information and put it in the file cabinet for further revelation. And you know for sure when you get to heaven, it's all going to come clear. Amen. But until then, these are jewels that God places in our heart with opportunities to find out what's going on. But we do know this, somewhere during the course of time between circumcising Gershom and now, Zipporah seems to have, the little bird seems to have flown the coop. <laughs> and she went back with Jethro, Ruel, her father, her father-in-law, or her father and brother-in-law, however you like to say that. She was back there, but now, look what's happening. Jethro's heard of all the things. Moses told him, God has told me, i got to go do this. i got to go tell my people, let me go. He conferred with Jethro. If you remember, he asked permission. Can I do this thing? And if you remember, Jethro said, well, if God told you to do it, you better go do it. <laughs> if you remember that story. So here now, Jethro's hearing, wow, <laughs> it sure was God. It was amazing. He's heard about it. And he's like, you know what, honey, that husband of yours, he might be a wild man. He might be an ex-con. He might be a murderer. But I think God has his hand on him. And I think it's time that you come back and make up. <laughs> so, I, so I'm filling in a little bit there. Okay, I'm taking some liberty. But you, you fill it in how you like. Or just take it at point blank value. For whatever reason she went away, now she's coming back. With, verse 3, her two sons. Now, we only saw one before, now we've got two. With her two sons, whom the name of one was Gershom, we already know, for he said, I have been a stranger or a sojourner. I've been an alien. I've been expelled in a foreign land. 
Sounds to me like he's referring to his life as an Egyptian. We read in Hebrews that he didn't consider it uh, a, a special thing to hold on to, the passing pleasures of sin in Egypt, even as prince of Egypt, but he chose to throw his lot in with his people. So he had been an alien, a foreigner, and literally when he committed this capital offense, he was a man on the run. He, he was an alien and expelled. And so he names his son like that. Okay, you, you're going to be with me. We're just going to be on the run for the rest of our lives. No permanent address. And then, verse 4, the name of the other was Eliezer. For he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And so this could be in reference to when he fled because of the murder and was protected from Pharaoh. It could be during the time of the plagues. And then as Pharaoh followed him with all the 600 chariots that God protected him that point, at that point. But if that's the case, it wouldn't make any sense because he would have been born when Moses wasn't there. Moses could have never named him. So somehow it seems as though Eliezer was part of the picture earlier, just not mentioned in the Zipporah and Bridegroom of Blood incident. Maybe Eliezer in some way wasn't the problem, but Gershom was, and that caused the incident. I, this is a lot of speculation. I Please understand, this is not, I'm not giving you gospel. I'm just trying to help bring it to life. It's real people. This is a real deal, and there's some fill in the blanks, and we can kind of look around at life and go, that's how it usually works where I come from. But at any rate, Eliezer. Eliezer means God is my help. Beautiful name. We're going to meet a lot of Eliezer's in the Bible. Wonderful, top Jewish male baby name, right, of all time. One of those. It's way up there with... Things like Jesus, right? Uh, and uh, Eliezer, God is my help. Uh, beautiful, beautiful name. Um, and so verse 5, And Jethro, Moses' his father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now this isn't far for Jethro to go. This is where Jethro's from. But he heard, oh, he's back. That son of mine, that son-in-law of mine. That son-in-law of mine, that bridegroom of blood of my daughters, is back. And he's brought some friends. Where he was encamped at the mountain of God, Mount Oreb, or the back of the desert as we've described it. The place of desolation. And yet, here in this mountain of desolation, it's Rephidim. It is the place where... The rock, Christ, is there bringing forth living water for everybody. So uh, Jethro, he brings the sons and wife back. Verse 6. Now, he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law, Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down, and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. Beautiful family reunion. Everybody's happy, they're glad to see each other, whatever cause they're parting, uh, it's, it's behind them, and they're just so glad to be together. Wonderful family reunion. Again, part of the Middle Eastern hospitality, but also these family bonds. And as you think of this story, which we're going to be thinking of for quite a while, this story of Egypt's journey from the wilderness through to the promised land, we know Moses the lawgiver. We know Moses the interceder. We know Moses the friend of God. We know Moses the most humble man on the face of the earth. But don't forget, he's Moses the family man. In all of what we're going to read, all the trials, all the tragedy, all the troubles, all the things that the children of Israel go through for the next 40 years, just don't forget, Moses is a family man. He's got wives, 
a wife, he's got children, he's got other issues on his plate than just shepherding this nation of people. He's got his own personal issues to deal with. Verse 8, And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to the Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake and all the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord had delivered them. So he didn't pull any punches. The good, the bad, the ugly. Wow! Pharaoh did this! Oh, and God did that! And you can imagine how this must be for his father-in-law to hear all of these things. And uh, pretty amazing, but it's just one of those things that's, that's nice, it's wonderful, it's amazing, it's one of the most precious gifts you'll have this side of eternity is somebody who you can share your heartaches, your joys, your tragedies, your triumphs with, somebody that'll listen, somebody that is wise and you can enjoy. I've been so blessed. Um, my father-in-law is with the Lord now. And I knew him before he knew the Lord. And I knew him as more of Moses before Christ. And I got to know him as Moses after Christ. I was so blessed by him, and I can't tell you how many times in my life, just this last couple days, up on the mountain hunting, I'm talking about my, my father-in-law, and how he would love to go out and harvest deer. He built him a, himself, I, I don't know if it was hickory, but it was a wonderful walking stick. He put a little crook on it, so even when he could barely walk, he could hang his gun on it. And I'm telling father-in-law stories, because I was blessed to have a godly father-in-law and enjoy fellowship with him. Moses is blessed this way and we all are blessed if we have somebody like that. Maybe it's not a blood relative. Maybe it's just a brother or sister you meet in church or out in the world in ministry, but somebody that you can tell them all the things that God is doing, the hardships and the deliverances. Verse 9, Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 10, And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hands of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now, just note here, Jethro, the excellent remnant priest of Midian, probable descendant of Abraham, is now saying, Baruch Adonai, bless the Lord. And if you look in your Bible, that is capital L-O-R-D. This is the unpronounceable name, personal name of God. Not just bless God or bless the deity, Jethro is praising Yahweh God, okay? And in that, as we saw when we very first met him, his name, Ruel, means friend of God. And this kind of echoes that, right? It, it kind of gives you more reason to believe he's not just another guy. He's a God-fearer, okay? And uh, he's a good person for, for Moses. But he says... Um, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 11, now I know that the Lord, Yahweh, is greater than all the gods, for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he was above them. Now, this is going to cause people questions. Some people say he was a priest of Midian. Maybe he was a, a priest of other gods. Uh, polytheistic maybe a priest of many gods and we don't know any of that to read that in would be reading completely out of silence there's nothing said about that all we know about him is what we do see is that he praises the Lord right and and and, and worships God so I tend to lead to what the Bible leans us in the direction of um, but he does say now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods did he not know that before? Maybe. We don't know. 
Okay, but the Hebrew word here is yada. Yada is the word for experiential knowledge. You can know that God is good. You can know that Jesus is peace. You can know he's peace that passes understanding. But you can go through one of those dark parts of life, and he's there. And you can come out the other side of it, having been a confessing Christian for decades, and walk out and go, now I know. I have experienced God in a way that supersedes anything I ever dreamed or imagined. And how many times you go walking through life and go, wow, you're an awesome God. I know that's you. So it could simply be that he's, his, his knowledge of God is growing. But he does know. And this is a knowledge. It's not a wonder or I think he could be. Man, he's better than all those other gods. And he's not even saying that they're really gods, but they're false deities, right? We saw them, the frog god, or the hail god, or the river god, right? And all these, and, and yet, Yahweh, who he calls him God, trumps them all, okay? So look at verse 12. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God, and... Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. So they have a special reunion, and they, 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 they have an offering. A, a, burnt, a consecration offering, a burnt offering, is where you would take that sacrifice that you want to give to God, you place it on the altar, and just let it be burnt, consumed completely. You don't eat any of it. It's all given to God. It's a picture of giving your all to God. Just consume me. Every speck of my being, I want to give to you. I love what Paul says in Romans. By, I beg you by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice. Right? Perfect and acceptable to God. And this is that picture of just giving yourself wholly to God. And that's what's happening here. They, and other sacrifices, it says, to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel. Remember, we saw God told Moses, take some of the elders with you when you go to the rock, and then when you strike it, there'll be witnesses. But there's already elders, okay? Those people who are wise and respected amongst the community, they are leaders within the community, take these leaders with you. So now they're coming to this celebration. Ruel, my father-in-law is back. He's brought my wife and my sons. We're offering up a burnt offering, giving ourselves wholly to God. And they're breaking bread together, it says, to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And so, without a doubt, what you, whatever you may think about Ruel slash... Jethro before clearly he's worshiping God here okay and I personally believe it's a picture that his father-in-law was a God-fearer and his experience with Moses brought him into a deeper new relationship with God than he had never known ever known before you know how often we can know about God, we can study about God, we can hear about God, right? And you could even pass an exam about God, but then all of a sudden you meet somebody who's walking it out, like walking it out, and you start listening to their God stories, to their Jesus hugs, and you're like, wow, wow. And you start experiencing that yourself, and you just move into this whole new world with God. Does that mean that you didn't know God before? Of course you knew Him. When people come to know the Lord, I was talking to somebody on Sunday. Uh, their daughter wanted to get baptized. Well, that, my, one of my first questions in there after I got her name, how old are you? She said she's eight. And I said, what do you think it means to be baptized? 
He says, well, it means that you believe that Jesus is your Lord and you want to follow him. I'm like, that pretty much qualifies. I don't need to go through a long list of questions to make sure she really knows what baptism is. I'll tell you what. Most all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, really didn't know all that baptism was when we got baptized. Amen. We just knew that Jesus did it, and the Bible says we should do it, so we did it. And as you start walking down your life, your appreciation of it grows deeper and richer. And, and, and even where you are right near here tonight, should the Lord tarry, you're probably going to know more a year from now than you do now. So I would say, yeah, Jethro was a believer, but now he's come into an even deeper relationship. Okay, Verse 13. And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. And just so that you know, in the Hebrew, the um, two words here, sat and stand, are also, uh, they can be used as the judge and the litigant in a court type case. Sat, sat describes the judge, stood, stood describes the litigant, okay? The person that's coming to the judge for whatever recourse they're looking for. So it can work both ways, but you want to notice who's sitting. Did you see right there? Yeah, Moses. Moses is sitting, and what are the people doing? Standing, okay? So it's a bit like of a courtroom case. These are, it's, it's, it's legalist, legal terms that are kind of being described here. Uh, so when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you, uh, uh, why do you alone sit? Okay? And that word for sit can be judge. Okay? Why do you alone judge and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty or a dispute, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. Okay? And that... That word for statue, it comes from the word of prescribed or allotted or boundaries or ownership. So I make known to them what God says about these things. What are the boundaries? What are the rules? What are the, the laws, if you will? That's what I do. I, I help them understand the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do is not good. Now, I did my very best to build for you a case of a loving relationship of a son-in-law and a father-in-law. Because if you didn't know that, you'd probably read that last verse and go, Oh, brother, my father-in-law is telling me what I'm doing is not good. Have you ever known a father-in-law or women, a mother-in-law, that would criticize the things that you're doing. They know how to do it better. Or they are not pleased with you. And how often it is, it's the in-law, you're just not good enough for my girl. <laughs> kind of an idea. Okay? I would suggest to you that's probably not the tone or the heart of Jethro here. He's just seeing his son, in-law, He's worked all day. You can't, you can't uh, um, discount him for not being a worker. He's been going at it from morning until evening. Okay? So he's working hard, but he says the thing that you're doing is not good. Verse 18, both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Now, some people, and again, I, you know, you, I told you you can read different commentaries, and there's three commentators, five different opinions. You know, a lot of people would look at this and go, should we, as Christians, take counsel from non-Christians? Because they would look at Jethro as a non-Christian. He's a Midianite. 
I believe he is a worshiper of God, and I believe his heart is wise. He's looking at his son-in-law and saying, you know, good job, young man, but look at me. I'm your elder. I'm wise. I've been around the block a couple more times. I got some advice for you. Now just remember, as Jethro, the father-in-law, talks to his son-in-law, Moses is at least 81 years old right now. Right? You're not like some young whippersnapper that just is still wet behind the ears. You your first rodeo, okay? Nevertheless, he brings... You're going to wear everybody out. You're going to wear yourself out, and you're going to wear everybody out. Can anybody imagine getting tired of standing from morning till evening trying to judge the disputes of two million people? Would that wear anybody out? Yeah. Of course it would, right? And yet, we've got to give it to Moses. Here he is doing it. As much as he may not be able, he's, I'm in. I'm in, you know? And, and in this, we're going to see Moses the leader. And one of the, one of the beautiful qualifications for Moses, even though he's not perfect at it, when God tells him to do something, he does it. No matter how hard, no matter how impossible, you've got to give Moses credit. He steps up and he swings the bat. Right? And he says, oh, I can't speak. You know, we'll give him a brother Aaron. He's not a perfect guy in doing this, but he did just rescue two million people from the greatest world empire of his day. Okay? And he's brought them across the desert back to the mountain just like God told him. I couldn't do that. Not without God. There's no way. I don't know of anybody that could do that kind of a thing. So you've got to give them credit, but they're going to wear themselves out. Verse 19. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And, okay, you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every greater matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter, and that word is daily matter, just the stuff that comes up every day, they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. This is pretty good advice, right? And it's the idea of delegation, sharing your authority. Sharing your responsibility. Asking other people to help you. And Jethro says, man, you've got to get some help. You're going to wear yourself out, and you're going to wear them out. Right? Have you ever heard the term justice delayed is justice denied? i got a problem. My neighbor borrowed my hoe. When he brought it back, it was broken. What do I do? How many of those cases do you think you can hear a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade, before you just wear yourself out? And how long do you think they're going to wait to get their hole repaired or replaced? Or, you know, the, the, it will cause problems if you don't deal with these issues. They need to be dealt with. God is not saying don't deal with them. God's not saying sweep them under the carpet. God's not saying ignore them. He's saying they do need to be addressed. Okay? I want to kind of back up just a little bit at verse 9. He says, listen now to my voice. Remember, this is Jethro talking. Listen to my voice, son-in-law, father-in-law. I want to tell you, I will give you counsel, okay, uh, advice, and God will be with you. Now, this God will be with you. You can get this confirmed. If you go um, into Deuteronomy, into the book of Numbers, 
you will see uh, Numbers 11, 14 through 17, Deuteronomy 1, 9 through 14. It repeats this episode, and in it, there, it says God told Moses to do these things. So did God tell Moses, or did Jethro tell Moses? God. Yes. Yes. Right? Yes. God told Moses through Jethro. Okay? God used Moses as that mouthpiece, and Jethro says, God will confirm it. You do this thing. If God's not in it, don't do it. But God will confirm this thing. This is wisdom from God. Can other people have wisdom from God besides you? Even if you've done it your whole life? Or even if you are the deliverer of the nation of Israel, two million people, and I've been doing this for six months. I know what I'm doing. You never delivered six million people, or two million people. You know, what do you know? One of the things I love in the Bible, it's one of these passages where Moses writes, and Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. <laughs> and I always, I always think that's so funny, because would you write that about yourself? And yet... I don't know how many people could get away with saying that. Moses could. He humbled himself constantly. And here he's humbling himself before his father-in-law and taking that advice. Even though he is the leader God has ordained. Clearly, he's the one who brought him across the Red Sea. I mean, he's, you know, he's not just some yesterday's news. He, he's Moses, right? <laughs> And, uh, and yet he's humble enough. And, he, and so this is advice. Um, God will be with you. Stand before God for the people. That's what Moses was told by God. You will be as God to them. I will speak to you. You will speak to them. You will be as God to the people. So stand before the people. Stand before God for the people. That you may bring the difficulties to God. This is so key in leadership. This is so key in ministry, especially for pastors and ministry leaders. You need to always, when people bring you difficulties, questions, concerns, you always bring them the Word of God. And as they bring all this junk to you, give it to God. Don't hold on to it. Don't stew on it. Don't let it become part of who you are. You're just a conduit. You just give it to God. You can't carry that much. It'll crush you to know all the aches and pains and miseries and griefs amongst all these people. You'll, you'll get broke down. And, you know, this passage right here is one, if you ever go to a pastor's conference... Not likely for most of us, because most of us aren't pastors. But if you ever went to a pastor's conference, this is probably one of the chapters you'll hear taught sooner or later. Because this is what pastors go through. It's what ministry leaders go through. And it will wear you out. The secret? Just speak God, be God to the people. Tell them, this is what God says. You want to come to me for counseling? Maybe you're having a marital problem, a financial problem, uh, employment problem, uh, children problem, parenting problem, whatever your problem is. I'll probably have one appointment with you. I'll listen. I'll ask you, please don't tell me the dirty details. Because I don't want those. I don't need them in my head. I mean, I'll tell you, you know what? In your circumstances, this is what the Word of God says. If it's, uh, and some of the issues that people deal with are far more entrenched than me just telling them. But I'm not going to get into ongoing, long counseling with people <laughs> over their issues. I'll do what God does to me. This is what I said, Mike. Now the question is, do it or don't? You going to do it or not? Okay. And so that's what the counsel is. And God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the law and show them the way in which they must walk and the work that they must do. So you are to teach them and you are to be an example to them. 
You stand before the people for God and bring the difficulties to God. That's intercession. That's prayer. Talk to God about these things. That's your job, Moses. You need to pray. You need to pray for these people. You need to teach these people what the Word of God says. If they know what the Word of God says, they're going to stop showing up at your doorstep. They'll know what to do with a broken hoe. You've already taught them what the Word of God said. And they can deal with it themselves. And then you must, it says, show them the way. You must be a living example of these things. So you pray, you teach, you model or demonstrate it, and it says, and the work that they must do. You're going to have to roll up your sleeves and show them that you're no different than they are, and you work too. You see these four principles. Pray, teach, show, and work. That's your job, Moses. And that's what you need to focus on. Okay? It goes on to say, Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men. There's four qualities. They've got to be able to handle these issues. Able men, such as fear God. That's the first qualification for a leader of God's people, is they must fear God. If they have no fear of God, if they have no uh, conscience, that they're going to have to give an account for everything they say, everything they do, and especially everything they lead people into. Multiple times the Bible tells, them, tells us about better that a millstone was thrown around your neck and you were cast to the bottom of the seas than you would lead a little one, one of these little ones astray. If you want to be a leader, if you want to be a teacher, if you want to be an example, if you want to be that person in there working in the ministry, you better be able and you better fear God. And you have to be men of truth. Just th Now, there's no perfect person but if you're playing around with the truth, that's not who we're looking for. This is not the qualifications. It's got to be black and white. We live in a world today, they used to call it a postmodern world two decades ago. Postmodernism was that idea that truth is relevant. You have your truth, I have my truth. We all have different truths. That, that came in decades ago. That ship has sailed so far, we don't have any idea what truth is in our culture today. Unless you have the Word of God, the rock, which never changes, everything is up for grabs. But you want to be a leader of God's people? You better fear God, and you better be a person of the truth. The way, the truth, and the life. And hate Covetousness. Covetousness. Desiring something that God has not ordained for you, given you. Nothing wrong with wanting something, setting your heart on it, working for it, and going and getting it. That's all fine in God's economy. You want to provide for your family, you want clothing, you want shelter, you want food. That's not a bad thing to want those things, but roll up your sleeves, go to work, and get it. Covetousness is when you want something that is not yours. God has not ordained it for you, but you want it anyways. And it's not just covetousness of material things. Oh, I wish I had a bass boat. Oh, I wish I had a nice deer rifle. Oh, I wish I, you know. Guess whose list... I'm talking about. <laughs> right? But you got yours. But it's not, covetousness is not just material possessions. Covetous can be a desire for prestige, position, power. Oh, I'd like to be a leader of God's people. Eh, disqualified. <coughs> 
I'll tell you what, and you'll probably know this from your own walk in life, most of the best leaders of God's people really didn't ask for the job. They just love the Lord, want to serve the Lord, and in obedience to Him, walking by faith, here they find themselves with two million people on the back of the desert. <laughs> it's not something you set out for if you're really that leader of God's people. You're just obedient. And if you covet the position or the title, I don't know how many times, especially when I'm talking with Bible college students, and I just, it always, I don't know what the right word is, it just causes me to pause how I'll meet these young men and, and they'll be, ah, oh, God's called me to be a pastor. I'm like, really? Wow. That's, I'm not saying that he hasn't. Because certainly he does call past people to be pastors, right? Obviously. But generally speaking, that's something that happens as you serve in children's church. And then you work with the kitchen ministry. And then you're in the parking lot ministry. And next thing you know, you invite some people over to your house for a Bible study. And, and it seems as though God's anointing is on you and... And they say, wow, when you teach, I understand God's word. And, and your Bible study grows. And pretty soon you're a ministry leader. And next thing you know, somebody says, we need somebody to help shepherd this church. How about you? It's like, me? What makes you think I could do that? Well, seems like you're able. You fear God. You're a man of truth. And you hate covetousness. You've got the character. You've got the fingerprints. Okay? And it says, uh, hating covetous, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. So break it down into small size pieces. Some people will be rulers of small groups. Others, rulers of large. And, and you'll know, you know, if God's in it. Um, and it says, and let them judge the people at all times. So this is going to be their regular job now. Their, their, their task, their <laughs> ministry, is to be there and do what Moses did. Remember, what did Moses do? He stood before the people as God, and he listened to what they said, and he gave it to God. He prayed, he taught, he modeled, and he worked. And now this is what these guys are going to do. Okay, it'll be their regular duties within the tribe of Israel. This is what they do every day. Same thing as you, Moses. In fact, I love what it says in Numbers eleven seventeen. In regards to this, it says, um, "Well, I'll pick up at verse sixteen, Numbers eleven sixteen. So the Lord said to Moses, "Gather to me seventy men of elders of Israel, whom know to be, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them." Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. So this is something that God does. Moses grabs these people. He's got the qualifications, able, fear God. But... Ultimately, it's going to be the anointing of the Holy Spirit on them, and they will be able to do this task. And it's a gargantuan task. Even if you take Moses, plus 70, 71 people, and divide up the workload amongst 600,000 men, how many does each one of the 70 get to deal with? It's a boatload, right? So that's still a huge, huge deal, okay? Um, but it will be easier for you for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure, and all this people will also gather to their place in peace. Okay, So this is much more than just worldly wisdom. And we see it go on through the scriptures. I guess I've got to finish, right? Verse 24, so Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads 
over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifty, rulers of ten. So they judged the people at all times. The hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. The difficult matters were for Moses. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way into his own land. We have a similar judicial system in America where you've got the county courthouse, right? Then you've got the state court, and then you've got the regional federal courts, and eventually you get to the Supreme Court, okay? The really difficult ones where we can't all agree. And so this is what they were doing. Um, in this, there's a model for how we do church government. I'm out of time, so I'm just going to briefly just hit a couple points. In the, gospel, in the book of Acts, there was a point in time where there were so many people coming into the church that there were a lot of widows, some of Jewish descent and some of Greek descent. And the women that were of Greek descent thought in the distribution of the bread and the foods that the Jewish women were getting a better deal. And so they brought this to the apostles, and the apostles said, it's not good for us that we should wait tables. We should devote ourselves to prayer and teaching. Where do you think they got that idea? Right here. That's what God said. A leader needs to really be doing. And so they appointed 70 men, full of the whole, or not 70, seven men, full of the Holy Spirit and of a good reputation. And they then took over that ministry. Amongst them were Stephen and Philip, which we hear more about in the book of Acts. But there was that idea of spreading the, the weight around. In 1 Timothy, we get the qualifications of an overseer and qualifications of a deacon. An overseer, a bishop, the, the word is episcopus, from which we get the denomination Episcopalian. But this is a, a, a church where the denomination, where there's one man, the bishop, and he rules over the fellowship, and in many cases it could be several fellowships in a community, and then there's deacons. They're the, the servants. They work within the church. It's, a, it's an important title. They have to be qualified. Uh, these are the qualifications in Timothy. And then also in Titus, it talks about the elders, the presbyteros. Want to guess which denomination is named after them? Presbyterian. The Presbyterians, right? And that's an elder-led or a group of leaders over the church. So in one situation, you've got one person, and then they've got um, deacons, and then in another, there's a group of men. And both are New Testament models of church government. Then there's another model that's grown up over the years that you find nowhere in the New Testament. It's the congregational government, where it's a democracy and everybody votes on everything. And you can see, if you go back here into the book of Exodus, that doesn't work really good. It didn't work with Moses, and it's never worked where everybody's got to vote. We don't run a church by the vote of people, okay? That would be humanistic. It's got to be a God-ordained, God-appointed leadership, and it could either be a single person as a pastor, or it could be a group of people. In the Calvary chapels, we follow more of a role that looks like Moses, where he is the leader, you could call Episcopus, anointed by God, and then he has men who are appointed to him that help out. And that could be considered deacons. It could be considered in our church, the Springs Calvary Chapel, we have a board of elders. And the board of elders are chosen by me. I'm the pastor, and I look at men that are able, that fear God, that have a good reputation within the church. And I look for men with certain gifts, certain talents, certain acumen that I lack because I need help. So I look for people that have experience in churches and a variety of experiences, not all the same. People that are businessmen, that have financial sense, that have wisdom in, in legal matters. So I've got these guys and I can say, hey, we got this issue. Can you help me? And we have a policy at the Springs that we never move forward on a major issue, a big financial issue, legal issue, uh, those kind of things, without everybody having a unanimous spirit. If 
we're sitting at the table and one person says, I just don't feel right about it, we'll table it until next time. We'll come back together. Sometimes it gets tabled for a year. These are things that I allow as the bishop or the pastor, I have, I have humbled myself under their hand. I've also told them, if I find myself walking into the weeds, if you, you find me uh, derelict in an area of morality or heresy, there's one other. I just lost it for a second. You have every reason in the world to call me out. And by all means, pick up the phone and call my pastor, Gerald Hagerman at the Springs Calvary Chapel, and say, you know what? we got a problem with Mike. And I have to be accountable to these people. But nevertheless, it's my role to lead, to set the course, to steer the ship, to bring items to the board meeting. We're having one tomorrow night. You can pray for us. And as we look at opportunities out in front of us, open doors. God has given us an open door. I think we need to walk into this. Okay, this is great. What's your plan? Well, I, I could use some help with that, guys. But I think we should do it. <laughs> and we put our heads together. And that's kind of how we run our fellowship here. There's no perfect church government. It would be if it was God. Strictly God. And the, the closest thing we can see to a perfect church government is right here where God ordains Moses. Moses appoints the 70 and they rule. And that's what's called a theocracy. God speaks, the people listen. They're taught, they're expected to obey. But I will tell you, even in this example, 1,500 years later, you know what those 70 elders did? They voted to crucify their Lord, the Sanhedrin, the 70 in Israel. So in whatever situation you look in, you've always got to be humble. You've got to be subject to the will of the Lord. And, and we all have to pray for each other. Amen? Father God, thank you for this evening, and I thank you for uh, the wisdom of your word. I pray that even in our homes we can apply these lessons that we've learned, that we would have love for one another. I pray for the blessing of having a Jethro in our life, whether it's a mother-in-law, father-in-law, or some other person to whom we can share all of our joys and all of our trials, Lord, and that they can have give us good wisdom. I thank you for the, the church that we have that's filled with Christians that have walked with you for so many years that can really help the next generation grow. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that as we submit to you, we will become the church that you desire us to be, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.